He wants to jump a car a mile. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. He wants to jump a car a mile. Uh, or we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. Yeah, I wouldn't have bought one that. if you didn't have one. People thought that was weird that you'd buy the same car as your friend. I was like, hmm, it's not yeah. weird. <laughs> Too many cars. Too many cars. <laughs> a phrase I possibly never would have uttered in my past. You're going to have you a target. Have. No, roses would be a, a rather soft target. So you have to... Sir, you have a thousand cars. <laughs> Muddy weight. Like I put my beer belly on it. If yeah. you can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have, you probably have too many cars. Yeah. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. He wants yeah. to jump a car. We're in the TSI SS 350. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? right. Why were you yeah. in it? It was thin and wimpy looking, so... You wanted a good, hearty coolant. Yes. Okay. I wanted a man's coolant. <laughs> have one of these monster trucks parked in your driveway. And you'll really give those up at a yuppie. Something to think about. A mile. Sunday, call. Sunday, Sunday, monster trucks at the Pontiac Silverdome. We're not yeah. talking about an airplane, we are talking about a car, so it's definitely going to have to crash right in this area. Yeah. Uh, you have a more specific taste I than do. I do. Yeah. So now, the guy's all excited because I'm here to buy this transmission. <laughs> not light. And he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small, it's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. Starting yeah. off with Brad buying another car. Yep, but engine. not. Just the engine. Because... Yeah. Oh. That's right, Brad. Bradley earlier said something about Iowa, and I was like, "Yeah, that's a, that's the West." Oh, you <laughs> talk about actually know what Watanabe's are. Been advertised yeah. in Denver. I mean, how much? You know, is this a Nigerian oil prince? What do I have to do? To, yeah. you know, how much? So, how many social security numbers does this guy yeah. need? One thousand right? cars is, in fact, too many cars. Anyways, <laughs> anyway, that, that's a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. All right, here we go. Put that down. Welcome to Auto Off Topic. How's it going, Brad? Uh, actually, wonderful, Andrew. How's it going with you? Uh, pretty good. We are back from another uh, unintentional break. Yes. Um, but we're recording in person. Yeah, for the first time recording in person together in Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, from a Phoenix backyard. Yes, not the Phoenix garage after the kids have gone to bed, as nope. our friend Brian used to say on the Gearhead Project podcast, but the backyard in Phoenix for sure. That's right. But it is after the kids have gone to bed. <laughs> My kid has gone to bed. I mean, it wouldn't be out of top if we didn't talk about the weather. It's pretty nice out here. Yeah, it's already outside. It's up uh, in the sky. Sum- summer is winding down here in Phoenix, so it's, oh, I don't know, probably... It's 85. 85 degrees right because now? Because the sun's gone down. 85 degrees. Not 105. Zero humidity, and uh, it's just comfortable. So it's a backyard podcast, so if you hear the neighbor's air conditioner kick on, apologies, but we're comfortable, so we don't care. Or your air conditioner? I was blaming it on the neighbor, but yes, we are sitting directly underneath my air conditioner, so it is what it is. It's a fairly quiet unit, though, actually. It's not like a window unit, so... Uh, I'd beg to differ, but... Well, I mean, it cools the whole house, and it's on the roof, which is something that, as a New Englander, is probably weird to you, seeing air conditions on the roofs of houses. It is weird, but I guess that's where you put it, because it's where the heat goes. Well, no, so what happened here in Phoenix is when central air first started coming on as like a, a thing here... Most houses already had uh, evaporative cooling conditioners, which used like a water to air cooling system, and they needed to be on the roof. So what would happen was the companies would change out the evaporative cooling for the central air, and they would just use the ducting that was already there on the roof. So they put them on the roof. Most new build homes don't have that. They have an air conditioner on the ground. So I heard a lot of people are going back to that it's pretty economical it's super economical and it works very well until the humidity goes over like 40 percent right once the humidity goes up you're all done Mm -hmm. so we have a roll around unit um well we don't but i've used a roll around unit like in the garage when it's 105 degrees out 110 degrees out and they actually work really well to cool down like your garage space pretty quickly and efficiently so unfortunately they also use water which is not in abundance in phoenix arizona but Anyway, what's your air conditioner history lesson for the day? Yep. What's uh, what's in the docket for uh, for conversation today, Andrew? Well, 
come join our Discord. Yeah, big number one point. Come join Discord. If you don't know what Discord is, don't be ashamed. Uh, I didn't either, really. Um, it started in the video game world, I think, right? Uh, yep. So it's a chatting app, I guess you'd call it. Uh, kind of like a, a messenger service. But it allows for very easy group chats. So we get a bunch of people together with like-minded interests. You can talk, you know, to one another, uh, private messages, and in a group. So we have uh, what they call channels inside our Discord. Um, the channels have... Oh, there it goes. Maybe it's a little loud, Andrew. I told you it's loud. Yeah. You're wearing the headphones. Can you hear it in the headphones? I don't know. I don't know. It's not loud in the house, so I don't think about it as loud, but whatever. Uh, anyway, join Discord. <laughs> I'll teach you all about air conditioners in Discord. Yeah, we have different channels in the Discord. We talk about different different subjects. There's one for you know, car sightings and traffic, one for project cars, uh, one for scale car stuff. And it's cool because it's not just you listening. It's part- participatory. So you know, if you join the Discord, you can come take and add your own thoughts to the conversation. And there's a good number of us in there chatting and just talking all day long. So it's good stuff. It's also a good place to give us our corrections <laughs> so we can fix them next episode. Yeah, but yeah, join it. It's a uh, there's a phone app or a website or an app for your computer or whatever. Just you can there if you don't want an app, just go on the website. And if you want to download an app, even easier. So I enjoy it thoroughly. I enjoy the conversations we have there, and uh, you can even explore other Discord channels and there's other things for all kinds of hobbies out there. So it's a good time. It's the best place to contact us because if we're busy, there's other people in there that will talk to you. Yeah, exactly. It's the best place to contact us because somebody else will deal with it. <laughs> no, I'm just saying if because sometimes we're busy and if you message us, we won't necessarily get back to you right away. But if you just throw a thing in the Discord, someone will talk to you. Yeah, that's the cool thing. It's it's we're building a community. We're building a community of I don't want to say we're building a community of auto off topic listeners because it's not what it is. It's we're building a community of like minded people. Like generally, anybody who listens to our podcast probably has the same affliction of working on old garbage cars, and we all kind of found each other. We all chat on there, and like he said, if if something comes up, you get a question, or you want advice on working on something, you can ask it there, and somebody there has has the experience, and will tell you what's going on. So it's a uh, it's a pretty good pretty good setup. I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying it, and uh, trying not to let it distract too much of my work day. <laughs> mm-hmm. So good times all right brad since we're out here uh and i've been out here for a few weeks uh i've been helping you with some of your project cars you want to go over some of the stuff you've been doing project car updates from the fleet of garbage here in phoenix sure uh where do we leave off we left off with a broken eclipse yeah i think i can follow up with saying we still have a broken eclipse but we've narrowed it down. It's far less broken. It's less broken. I'm actually currently driving it to and from work. It scared me today because it sputtered a lot. Like I thought I wasn't going to make it home under its own power. Um, oh, okay. So not ideal. But we had a double problem. So I think we talked about the cam sensor. Because the cam sensor is a combination cam and crank sensor yeah and it's works on the new one works on there's two versions in the yeah. DSMs. there's one that's um hall effect <laughs> and there's one that's optical and the earlier ones have a green top those are the optical ones and the l- later ones have a black top those are the hall effect ones and for whatever reason you're carving a 93 it had a hall effect it had a hall effect so we changed it with an optical sensor because it was easier to get. Uh, big shout out to our friend Keith who brought one over for us. And the car started right up. So that was good. What wasn't good is that it wasn't, seemingly wasn't taking time correctly. Like it wasn't advancing under load or something wasn't happening. And it almost sounded like it was pinging really bad. That's my assumption. So I went back and forth. Finally, I said, "You know what? This is a used sensor. Maybe it's bad." 
the original sensor, what happened was the part of the sensor that tells the fuel injectors to fire stopped firing. And there's no failsafe. What we thought on this one was that the part of the sensor that tells the coil to fire wasn't firing. And according to the factory service manual, there is a failsafe if that goes, and it will almost like run on limp mode to get you home, which is why it wasn't running good and why it was like not taking time properly. So we're like, all right, we tested it in the same way we tested it before. I think we talked about that before. Maybe not because we haven't no, talked about it. No, we didn't. Yeah. Uh, I originally I was like, this sounds like a bad ECU because it's super common. Uh, and we took the ECU out, and it was definitely bad. Yeah, and then somebody gave you our friend Jeremy gave yeah, you. Yeah, Jeremy, ECU former to guest test. of the show, gave us a, a a a known good ECU to test. Yeah, but it turns out that ECU is probably not good either. It may be good. It may just not be compatible, too, because it's out of an American market car versus a Euro car. Don't, so we it doesn't don't know. really matter. I think yeah. it's also bad. They're, Who knows? These ECUs exist in two states. They're either good or bad. I mean, that's most things in life. They're either broken or not. <laughs> unless they've just been rebuilt, you just assume that they're bad. Yeah. So it did, it did allow the car to run. So anyway, so I got a it brand. Was, it was running, though, but it wasn't letting the... Uh, it wasn't seating the um, top dead center sensor. Correct. So it was running on like a limp mode. Yeah. So it wasn't advancing the time as the car would under a load. So the car would just like break up real bad. Yeah. So we didn't think it was the ECU at first. We thought it might be that used cam sensor we put in there. So I bought a brand spanking new cam sensor online and put that in the car. And the problem didn't get any better. So then I swapped back to the other cam sensor, the replacement cam sensor. And then I said, well, the first thing we did with this when it wasn't running was we changed the ECU. And we took the ECU out of the car, we split it open, and we saw that the caps had leaked and made a mess on the board. So we assumed that the ECU was the problem. Obviously, we put it in, the car didn't start, the ECU wasn't the problem or wasn't the whole problem. So I took out the replacement ECU that I had left in since that first test. And I put the original ECU back in. And then the cam sensor worked properly. Yeah. So the car was running and running most excellent. So I said, all right, I'm going to drive this car to work tomorrow. We're going to figure out what's happening, make sure everything's good. I'll do a bunch of local trips before I take it any distance. I drove it to work the next day. And about halfway there... All of a sudden, it started bucking like crazy, like it was cutting out either fuel or spark, and the car was just like sputtering in traffic. And it eventually cleared up and went away, and I drove to work. Yeah, so the way you're describing that to me, that's the ECU is going bad. That's what they do. So that's our assumption now, because it has it's still doing that. So the problem is I've been trying to get in touch with ECM Link. Yeah. Because they're the company that rebuilds these ECUs, and they just haven't gotten back to me yet, and it's been three weeks. So i got to figure out a place that can rebuild this ECU now because, unfortunately, I'd like to keep the ECU that came out of the car because of the Euro market. I don't know what the difference is, but it's got a different part number on it. There is no differences. But Listen, it's got a different part number on it. There's a reason for that. Whatever that reason is, I want to make sure I have the right rebuilt ECU in it. So I, I need to have the ECU rebuilt. I just need to get in touch with somebody who will do it because outside of my skill set, I don't know how to solder boards and stuff or, or even know what to buy to do, fix it. So that's their job. They're experts. I'd like to have them do it. Plus, they bench test them and make sure they're good. So hopefully I can get a hold of them and they can do it because it seems to be that's going to be the problem. So I don't know. It's uh, Yeah, it's likely that the ECU fried the Hall Effect one and the... Optical ones are just more robust. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the one that's in the car now is currently being fried by the ECU. And when it skips like it does, it's probably not good for it. So, whatever. I can't stress too much about it right now until I can get the ECU rebuilt, right? Yeah. So, let's uh, figure that out. I need to figure out who can who can fix that ECU. So that's project car number one. Um, 
we did go to the junkyard. We did. And got a bunch of parts to convert your Gallant from auto belts well, to manual belts. we went looking for the cam sensor, and I was like, well, Correct. we're going to go. There's a lot of pull-apart yards out here. We've talked about this before. I was like, yeah, let's look up all the cars that I own, because I always do, because I always need something. Um, there's a Montero I'd still like to go find, because maybe it has a cloth interior. But that that was in a different yard. The one yard we went to had a 95 G20, or was it 94? Either way, say it right body style. And it was an auto, but I was like, oh, maybe it has the um, sun visor I want, uh, or maybe something else. I'll just look through it. And there was also a Gallant, like an early 89 Gallant non-turbo. And then there was a first gen, uh, was it Eclipse or a Talon? It was an Eclipse. Yeah. And we thought, maybe we'll get lucky. But that car was missing the head. It was missing a lot of parts, actually. Hey, we're pretty sure it was actually a 1.8 car anyway. Yeah, but it it had two good wheels for you. It had two, like, absolute mint condition of the turbine-style first-gen wheels. Yeah. Which are on my car, and I have two that are basically not round anymore and don't hold air very well. So it's perfect. Yeah, that was a score. <laughs> yeah, thirteen ninety nine each. <laughs> and then uh, I'm looking at this 89 car. It didn't really have... I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't really have much of that I need. I wanted a cloth back seat, but it had like a bluish gray back seat. Yeah, it was a weird early color back seat yeah. I've never seen before. But it was a gray interior, and it had the 89 underdash with the pullout, yep. which is a very rare thing that everybody wants for their VR4s. I already had one. I grabbed one years ago off the forum, so that, that'll go to your car. Correct. And then uh, it had like the little intake flapper door thing by the... The battery tray? The battery tray air cleaner that I wanted that my car was missing. And it's just a weird thing I wanted to put back in to make it look stock. It doesn't really do anything. It's just a stock piece that people throw away. And it's really annoying. Um, oh, and then I was just like, all right, I guess there's nothing else in here. And you're like, what about the A-pillar trim? I was like, oh, yeah. Because I have A-pillar gauges and the A-pillar trim is impossible to find. Right. And these were mint. And they were mint. And then I was like, oh, there's nothing else. And you're like, what about the manual belts? I was like, it has manual belts? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, don't you want those? <laughs> so, yeah, I got lucky. I grabbed all the interior pieces, all the seat belt parts, so I can convert my car to manual belts, just like a Canadian car. <laughs> yep. It's going to be much more uh, livable for you now. Yeah, than getting choked out by the auto seat belts. Yeah, if uh, if you weren't here and I needed parts for my car, I would have grabbed those for myself. But that's certainly a that'll be a score for you because my car doesn't even run. So, <laughs> yep, you win this round. But it was a it was a pretty clean car. I had three hundred thousand miles on it, so I was surprised how clean it was. Mm -hmm. But somebody deemed it uh, not worth fixing for whatever broke. So. No, it was. Uh, I think oh, it was, it was abandoned. It was right abandoned. Too. Same with the the G twenty was abandoned. Yeah, they had abandoned car tags on them, which I assume means it was broken though. Yeah, it broke somewhere and then yeah, it just got left there. But it was funny that I posted that G20 on the G20 Facebook group because there are some people that are out here in Phoenix and they're like, "Like, what are you doing? It's too hot to be out there." I'm like, "Well, I'm not from here." Yep. <laughs> and I was just checking. I always check the yards out here for parts for my '90s cars. And if the car is there, it doesn't matter what time of year it is. You better get the parts because it's only going to be there for a few weeks yeah, and you're going to crush it. Yeah, I gave a little report and I don't know, a couple of people said they were going to go pick over what's left. And I mean, it's already there. I might, you might as well let enthusiasts at it so some other cars can live. So Yeah, absolutely. Rather than have good parts, the whole car is getting crushed. So rather than have rare good parts get crushed with it, go get them off there. Yeah. A couple of people were like, or one person was like, oh, I already grabbed the headlight out of that thing in the mirror. Yep. So... So a successful junkyard trip was had. Yeah. So. Now I want to go check for that Montero. I wonder if it's got if it's got a beige cloth. That would be. All right. Well, let's go. Sweet. We have uh, this Saturday morning. Maybe we'll have to get right out there, or Friday afternoon or something. We'll figure yeah, it out. We'll see what's going on. So uh, let's see more project car updates. So Cressida. Cressida. We haven't done much yet. Uh, we left off. I think in the last episode I had asked you. That, uh, you know, to have your electronic expertise yep. in helping diagnose the, it's kind of like a, 
It's like a flapper door on the intake on this car? It's a Bosch system. Like, it's either K-Jetronic or J-Jetronic. Yeah, it's an early, early style of fuel injection, so it's got this, you know, like, flapper door mixing valve. Yeah, it's like a German. In the oh, intake it itself. Um, I don't think it's actually a Bosch. I think it's... N- I don't know. The book says Bosch, J-Jetronic, Does or it? K-J... It's, it's one or the other. It's based on a Bosch system, I think. Anyway, we were able to take the flapper thing off the car and run tests with the multimeter. You know, between this pin and that pin should give you this impedance, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So we tested that whole thing, and everything checked out and worked great. So the flapper door is not the issue. Uh, The issue with the car, as a quick reminder, is it runs, it idles. It actually idles pretty smoothly. And it runs pretty smooth up to about, I don't know, 1,500 RPM. And then if you put your foot down, it sounds like it just falls on its face. It's like, you know, nice smooth, like, whirr. And then you put your foot on the gas all the way down, and it goes, bah. So it almost sounds like a restriction somewhere, which I thought it might be that flapper door. So you were like, well, the wire to the O2 sensor is broken, in which I was like, I'm aware, but I didn't think it would make that much of a difference. Well, it's, it's going to give some sort of feedback. It'll give something. So you actually, while well, I was at work one day and you were here, uh, you threw the O2 sensor in, and it did seem to make a little bit of a difference. It idles up to like maybe like 2,000 RPM now instead of 1,500. Doesn't it stay running? It stays running much better, that's for sure. It just yeah, it so idles a lot better. Giving it feedback. Yeah. So when I say it idled well before, I had to give it like a little gas to keep it idling. Now with the O2 sensor, it'll just idle on its own. Yeah. So I bought... We can hear a giant vacuum leak, so the next step, which we will probably also do this weekend, hopefully, uh, is to start running a bunch of vacuum lines. I think it just has a massive vacuum leak, and that's and why maybe, it's not revving up. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I mean, you can hear it. I hope that's all it is, because that will be a miracle. And they're extremely dry rotted. Because the car sounds great otherwise. But the motor doesn't make any noise. It's pretty quiet. It's pretty smooth. Everything seems to work, so hopefully that'll fix the car. So, uh, let's see, Honda Civic. We decided the head is actually bad on that car. So the head or the engine's bad? I'm going to guess the head, only because it ran fine before it didn't. So I don't think the valves are that bad. I mean, the uh, rings are bad. So, But that car is technically gone anyway because... Uh, I won't say additional project car because it's replacement project car project car stasis yeah project car stasis but new project car runs so it's less of a project car right that's how it works i guess it still needs things it needs things but it can be driven as is right now yeah not comfortably because the front springs were cut to within an inch of their life um and the air conditioning was working and stopped so i'm assuming it's gonna leak somewhere which i'll have to diagnose and fix but uh, there was purchased a first year E7 Corolla station wagon. So that's, I think, TE72 is the chassis code? I don't know. You're telling me. I don't know what they're called. TE72. It's the square body cor- square Corolla. It's the last generation of rear wheel drive Corollas. Okay. So they came out with the TE and the AE. Which the AE is famous, obviously, for the AE86, right? Okay. So the TE is actually a similar chassis that gets less love because no initial D. So it's the same rear axle. The front suspension components are almost interchangeable. I think there's a different bolt pattern on, like, the upper hats. But other than that, it's pretty much interchangeable. It's a rear drive, solid axle, um... You know, we're circulating ball style steering with a four cylinder, 1.8 liter 3TC four cylinder. That's the uh, Toyota, the Toyota Hemi, I guess. It's a little Hemi head. Um, very cool little car. It's neat. It's brown. It's a station wagon, four door station wagon, brown metallic with a tan interior. Uh, it's a cool car because it was technically a one owner car until 2020. And it has a literal stack of paperwork that is uh, from 
day one purchase of the car through when the previous owner rebuilt the engine in 2019. That's pretty neat to have. So figuring out the mileage on it, it's either five or 600,000 miles on the car over time. But with the fresh engine and the car, as you saw and experienced because you rode in it, car actually, for everything it is, it runs great. It runs really good. So it's got a bunch of miles on it. Unfortunately, there was an owner in between myself and the previous owner and the original owner who thought that because it was a Corolla, it needed to be lowered on the ground with big, huge exhaust pipes and bolt-on fender flares and cut springs and lowering blocks in the rear. So what we're going to do is undo all of that stuff. Uh, I actually already pulled the rear flares off because the sheet metal there is still there. Unfortunately, somebody did cut the front fenders, so I need to find a set of front fenders for it. But it's a neat little project. It's a running and driving project. I think if I fix the front springs and put a slightly smaller lowering block in the rear and fix the air conditioning, it'll be a great little commuter car, actually, because it gets great gas mileage. It's got that fresh motor in it. Uh, it's already converted to a Weber, so it already has a much more easy-to-deal-with reasonable carb. It's a five-speed wagon, which is cool. Um, it's just a neat little car. I've always admired these cars. It was one of those things that was kind of fell on my lap, but here it is. So, new project car is a 1980 Toyota Corolla station wagon. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Which is the quad headlight, one year only cool look with the four round headlights, which is nice. Also, not nice because I can't find fenders because they're specific for that car for that one year. Yeah. So, that's a good way to bring us right into JCCS. Yeah, we've done a couple of cool events since you've been here. JCCS being one of them, uh, we actually just got back yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> We're not even fully recovered from the trip yet. It's a, such a fun event. I mean, I think the crazy thing to me, and probably to you, Andrew, is we've been into old Japanese cars for a long time. That's right. I don't want to say that we're like old Japanese car hipsters, but it's kind of what we are. Yeah, we definitely are. Yeah. Um, some of the old Japanese cars that we're into weren't even old Japanese cars at the time. They were new Japanese cars, which is weird. Yeah, that's what happens when you get oh, old. Oh, time, man. Time, uh, time stops for no man, right? So I think... The hard rule at JCCS is 1999, uh, maybe? Okay. It's previous? I, I, I'm misspeaking on that, possibly. I think but earlier it was 95. Yeah, for a while it was 89, I think. And then it became 95, and now it's moved up to 95, which is, or 99, which is not the end of the world. I mean, at this point, a 1999 car is 23 years old, right? That's pretty much a traditional antique yep so it makes sense but obviously the appeal of jccs has always been and will always be probably the chrome bumper cars i'd say like the 70s yeah into early i mean 80s. there was a lot of uh what's the what are the terms for it i always forget them what terms are we talking about isn't there term well there's neo classic they were calling it. Yeah, Neo Classic is like 95 and up. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of those cars. Yeah, they were a good amount. There was a bunch. I'd say probably 80s was the most popular class. If you had put them into years, right? Because all the Hondas were like all 80s to early, early 90s. Mm -hmm. There was a bunch of, oh, maybe it was 90s. I don't know. Maybe you're all right. Because there was a bunch of like RX-7s. and Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's different than it used to be. Uh, it started off years ago as an all Toyota chrome bumper event, but has evolved with the time. And like I said, somehow it's that somehow 1999 was 23 years ago. It's, it's it is what it is. I remember the first year I went to JCCS myself was 2012. Mm -hmm. So at the time, a car from 99 was not allowed in. <laughs> yeah, it was more chrome bumper stuff. It was a lot of you know, 70s rotary engine Mazdas and a lot of Datsuns. And I remember there right. were even two Colts there. There are no Colts there this year. So I think the show has changed a little bit and evolved with the times. But my favorite thing to see there still probably is the Chrome Bumper stuff. Yeah. So I, I am obsessed with and always have been 
with the 70s Japanese cars because that was kind of the beginning of the Japanese car, you know, I don't want to say invasion of the country, but it was a certainly a, a, the beginning times for Japanese cars here. I mean, there was some stuff in the 60s, but the 70s and the fuel crisis is obviously when they really took hold. And being on the East Coast, we don't see as much of that you know, growing up on the East Coast because they were seen as throwaway cars, as they probably were in California as well. But the difference is a throwaway car in California sat in somebody's backyard for 15 years and didn't rot away. Whereas a throwaway car in Massachusetts became one with the earth before anybody cared. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as common to see them out there and out in California it is. So also the fact that most of the original Japanese car dealers started in California. So they just had a bigger foothold out there. So it's neat to see the chrome bumper stuff in California that you don't see in the rest of the country. So JCCS, as always, the show itself was excellent. The variety was excellent. The people are always excellent. I do laugh every year because I go out there, go to the show, and spend all this time, six hours away from home, hanging out with all the people who live within 10 minutes of here. But Yeah, I don't know what's up with that. It is, what, problem. It is what it is. <laughs> I mean, we don't not hang out here either, but you know, it's an excuse to hang out out there at a different event. Uh, also, quick aside, the Route 66 JDM Classic in Williams, Arizona is coming up on the 1st of October. So if you're anywhere in the area, check that one out. That's a good show, too. It's like our own local JCCS. Not quite as big, but definitely mostly pre-95 cars and mostly chrome bumper stuff. So definitely a good take. Good times there. Uh, anyway, going back to the show. So we drove out Friday night. We didn't take an old car. We took Andrew's Volkswagen. Yep. Nice and comfy. Safe. All-wheel drive. It was nice because it was pouring rain on the 10 the whole way out there. And what can people not do on the 10, Andrew? Well, it might as well have been snowing for them in California. My God, so many scars spun out into the walls. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know if they don't have, like, tire inspections there. That's my assumption. Like, here, there's no safety inspections, just emissions. So you can roll into an emission station with bald tires, no fenders, no lights, and all they're checking is emissions, so you pass and go home like nothing is wrong with your car. So I'm assuming California is the same way because the second it rained, it was it was like Mad Max Fury Road all the way into Long Beach. Oh, yeah. It was, it was a disaster. I don't even understand. But it was nice to not be in an old car in that situation. It was nice to have the, the comfort and convenience of being in your 2019 Volkswagen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I do. I will say, though, moving forward, I'm not going to not drive a car to JCCS. No, spectating is not great, unfortunately, for that show. I don't want to say it's not great. Oh, no. The it's spectating itself isn't bad. No, no. Once you're in the show, the, the car, you know, what you're seeing is good, but the challenge to get in there as a spectator is annoying. Yeah. It's not worth it. So I think it's worth it, but it's definitely annoying. So we got there. Gates open for spectators at 9. I was told to get there closer to 8. I think we probably got in line at, what, like 8.20? Yeah, we were halfway down the block. Yeah, I'd say we were between an eighth and a quarter mile from the entrance. Yep. It was long distance from the entrance because that's how long the line was. And it wasn't like the line started there. Like the line started at the entrance and we were an eighth to a quarter of a mile away. It went around the corner from where we... It was probably a mile long spectator line that didn't get any shorter until afternoon time. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots of spectators. I can't believe how many spectators there were. That's yeah, the most I've ever seen for so a many, show. So many. So I would say my biggest gripe of the whole show started when we first got there. Once we finally got through all that, and this is through no reflection on the JCCS crew. This is whoever the venue, which is which is a state-run park, so the city of Long Beach has the security here. They were a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> um, if you look at the ticket that you purchased to go in, it says that no outside food is allowed. 
beverages are allowed in a clear sealed container and that if you have a hydro flask or refillable water bottle <laughs> excuse me a hydro flask or refillable water bottle is subject to inspection now being a normal human being with normal thoughts subject to inspection means they want to make sure you're not trying to smuggle in booze right yeah and that you can bring it just don't smuggle anything in it bring it with water that's fine or empty or empty even so we get to the line and andrew is in front of me and he has his hydro flask inside his backpack walks up to the security guard they open his backpack they look at it the hydro flask is right on top Oh, yeah, I didn't hide it. He didn't hide it. They didn't say anything. Because why would he hide it? He didn't know he had to hide it. Because it said it was subject to inspection, so I offered it up. I was right behind him, and the security guy looked at me and said, you can't bring that in. I was holding it in my hand. I said, I can't bring what in? He's like, the water. I was like, yes, I can. He said, no, you can't. I said, yes, I can. And he goes, no, you can't. And I was like, well, it says that I can. And he's like, show me where it says it. So I went on the, the website, pulled up my screen, and showed him where it says water bottles are subject to inspection. So I pointed it out to him. He looks right at me, and he goes, I just inspected it. You can't bring it in. Now, he never inspected it. He just looked at it. Absolute power trip on this guy. So mad now. So I'm like, listen, it's water. It's Southern California in September. It's hot. I'd like to bring my water in. Nope. Can't bring it in. Okay, what should I do with it? Put it on the ground over there. I'm like, put it on the ground outside the gate all day? He's like, yeah. I was like, I'm not doing that. He's like, well, you're not bringing it in. And I was like, I, I don't know what you want me to do then. And he's like, listen. I'm a 30-year Army vet. Do you think you're going to win this battle? Now, I'm not anti-military here, but I don't see what this has to do with anything. <laughs> I'm just reading the thing that says, hey, please, can I bring this water bottle in? Because the thing says, subject to inspection, inspect it. I'll even dump it out. Like, I don't care. I'll find more water inside and I'll refill it. We had water bottles in the bottom of your backpack. We could have refilled it. It wasn't the point. The point was, it said subject to inspection, not subject to some cop at the front gate, not even cop, security guard at the front gate saying, no, you can't bring it in. So I said, well, I don't want to put it on the ground because I don't want somebody to steal it. You mean to tell me you think someone's going to open your water bottle and drink your water? I, no, sir, I don't. I think someone's going to steal my $35 water bottle. That's what I think is going to happen. So anyway, at this time, there were maybe two other water bottles on the ground, which I assumed were staff. They were not. They were other spectators, apparently. By midday, we walked over towards that side of the car show, and there were hundreds and hundreds of hydro flasks on the ground. Because I'm sure if it said don't bring them, people would have not brought them. Right. Exactly. So, super frustrating that that happened. And I don't, and obviously, again, like I said, it was hot. It was Southern California. It was sticky. It was a day you needed water. Well, it wasn't sunny. And they're lucky it wasn't a sunny, hot day. Because there wasn't enough water in the place. There was not enough water in the place. And this is not the first time this has happened. It's funny because I've never really been to... I've never spectated a car show that had security. Or you had to, like, wait in line to get in. It's weird. Yeah. Well, you have. You just always had a car, so you didn't notice. <laughs> like, some of the Radwood shows were like that. And JCCS that you went to with me last year, but in my car, was like that. But we just didn't have to deal with it because it, we were in a car. It's just weird to me that you have that many spectators at a car show that aren't people who own the cars. Like, normally I just go to car shows, and it's just the people plus a couple others that own the cars. Yeah, it's it's strange. But it's, it's a thing with some of these Southern California shows, you know? And Radwood has the same kind of crowd. There's a lot more spectators sometimes at Radwood than there are car entrants, which doesn't always make sense to me, but whatever hey we were spectators this time so we were part of that crowd yeah right? i just never i've never experienced a car show that you uh i don't know pay to spectate it's just weird Norm like on the east coast they're normally just you walk in well the only thing i can compare you it might to pay if you're got a car 
yeah, sometimes you pay to get cars there, but you know, generally we go to such casual like cars and coffee style events that we don't even think about this because we're not like trophy car people, you know. So anyway, I, I, I would say the thing I would compare it to on these coasts might be like a World of Wheels or like an indoor kind of car show. Oh, I guess, but it's just very different on the West Coast, I guess. Well, I haven't been to any of the newer car shows that are like at Thompson. Although I'll say. I did have to pay thirty-five dollars to spectate Lemons. That was kind of dumb. Yeah, that's annoying. The Lemons car show? No, the Lemons race. Okay, like, like thirty-five bucks is a bit st- steep. As a spectator, it's a lot As a of spectator. money. Like JCCS was what, like fifteen or eighteen or something? Yeah, much more reasonable. I mean, the amount of money that JCCS makes is unreal. Between the merch and the tickets and the car entrance, and I mean, got probably fifteen thousand people there. If not more. Yeah. And then you got vendors doing limited drops of things, which is weird. You want to talk about that real fast? Sure. We've talked about hype culture kind of stuff in the past. Um, you know, again, talk about, you know, we're going to be grumpy hipsters here. Like, I've collected Hot Wheels cars my entire life. It's never been, like, a popular thing. It's always just been, like, super nerdy Brad thing. They're hugely popular now. And... Why I don't understand some of the popularity of it, I get it because I am also a collector of these things. It's in some cases a blessing because it's easier to get some things, and in some things a curse because it's harder to get other things. And some of these other things that are harder to get are also very expensive. Which, as a lifetime Hot Wheels collector, when all Hot Wheels cars were one dollar, it's hard to see people trading Hot Wheels cars sometimes for three and four hundred bucks a piece. Our biggest gripe right now, though, is pins. Uh, yeah, I don't know. To each their own, I guess. They're not for me. It's to each their own is one thing, and I get wanting. How to much have, do they cost? They're like Fifteen to twenty dollars, depending on the pin. Really? Yeah. So what blows my mind about it is why pins? How did pins become a thing? How did pins become a collectible trading thing in the car world, where you have like cartoon versions of your car? I do apologize for the rock sounds that are coming through the mics, probably. Since we're doing this outside, my dog wants to play fetch. <laughs> so we're currently yeah. playing fetch while recording, which is fine. She doesn't understand, so we'll let it slide. She's just a puppy. But anyway, yeah, I don't understand pins. It doesn't make any sense to me. Some of them are neat. I, I don't, wouldn't mind having a pin on like my cube wall at work for a car that I own or a car that I like. But the, the culture behind them is so strange. And the trading culture behind them. Oh, and the line was so long. Yeah, it's ridiculous. People wait for hours for a pin. Now, that being said, <laughs> we did wind up coming home with a couple of pins. Uh, yeah, I waited in line for a mat of the JCCS. Uh, uh, and a car. <laughs> so you yeah. waited in line for a die-cast car. It wasn't a very long line, though. Nope, because I don't think anybody knew he was over there. Yeah. So you waited in line for the car and the little mat, and it also I, came with a pin. I, even, I was like... Do, do I have to get the pin? I just want yeah, the car. And he's like, no, it comes with it. I was like, okay. Okay, we'll take the pins. So we have a couple of pins. Like I said, I, I'm not anti-pin. I'm just anti-hype culture. I don't I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. If people want something, why make it limited? Just make more. I don't think they are that limited. Or maybe they are. Well, there are certain ones that are limited, and that's the thing. Just like in you know, Hot Wheels, they have the treasure hunts now, which they have for a while. Which, again, was something that wasn't a huge thing until it was a huge thing all of a sudden. And I also think that the Japanese classic car show and the Japanese car culture is really what put Hot Wheels back on the map. It certainly is. Because these are the people that are... We're we're bleeding into our skill. Not off topic. That's fine. We haven't recorded it anyway. We can get there. We're talking about pins, Andrew, not skill cars. Let's go back. I don't know. It's weird to me. Uh, It used to be this weird little nerdy thing that just I did. And now all of a sudden it's like mainstream car culture to be super into collecting limited drops of things. The other things that bothered it wasn't even just the the pins. There were skate decks with cars painted on them as a big thing now for collecting apparently. Yeah, some people told me on Twitter they're like, Oh, it's really easy to like mount them on the wall. They're like cool wall art. It's really like, easy to mount a lot of things on the wall. Yeah, I could do posters. I like posters. Yeah. A skate deck is a limited But thing. I want like Original posters? Yeah, not ripped off, like, clip art design. Which there was one vendor there who had all this... Maybe clip art is selling it short, but 
like vector graphics that clearly he didn't draw because there were very, very varied art styles amongst all of them. It was printed on like a foam board. Yeah. Which is also weird. And then you can't be, frame it. And then it would be like Mitsubishi hub. Lexus yeah. hub. Yeah. Which is also weird. I'm like, okay, why? What? <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's like the hype culture thing happened and these things got popular. And then all of a sudden it was like other companies taking the cheapest way possible to get into this market. Like the guy who started the pin thing is this, his shop is lean customs, Mm -hmm. which they're neat. They were original. I can get behind that. They were cool. First I saw one, I was like, that's pretty neat. It's like a caricature of a car done in an enamel pin. Nobody was doing it. He started doing it. It blew up. Some of these lean customs pins that are from like old quote unquote drops or old releases, you'll see on eBay for five, six hundred dollars for a pin. Which is insane. I don't understand it. But I don't hate the fact that he made them because he didn't go into it making it a hype culture thing. It became a hype culture thing somehow, just through I don't know. Naturally, I guess. Organically. I guess I don't know enough about it. Maybe we should do a deep dive into what happened with pins and where it became a thing. I don't know. There's got to be a story behind it we can figure out. Because now there are like 13 copycat companies making the same kind of caricature as a lean custom, but branding them with their own brands. And just today, you showed me K&N Filters and some Instagram star teamed up together to make another one with a Subaru on it. Like, yeah. So that's like that's pretty mainstream of Kane and Filters is that they're doing it now, you know? Like it's not just this weird counterculture part of vintage car life. I don't know. I'm I'm lost, Andrew. I'm lost on this one. Is it because we're are we, are we aged out? That's what Stephanie told me when I was telling her about it today. I guess we're aged out. I will say I did learn another I, thing about pins. I used to collect pins when I was a kid, hat pins. Yeah, well, that's the big thing. Do you know where, you know where the most popular pins are in the world? No. Disney. Oh. Enamel Disney pins come out a few different times a year, and the Disney people go to Disney when they know they're coming out to buy the new pins to add to their pin collection. Like, I don't know. They're kind of a collectible thing. I mean, I used to have a hat filled with them. Sure, as a child. Yeah. Which some people look at us and be like, yeah, I used to collect those cars too as a child. So maybe we shouldn't say that. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't get it. And like, and apparently Stephanie agrees. Maybe we just aged out. But I have a cool new enamel pin of an S15 Sylvia that uh, I will put on my wall in my little cube at work. So well, I'll sell you mine for a hundred bucks because it was exclusive to JCCS. Yeah, but I get the same one, so you're out. I'm saying the person listening. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, so I don't have to buy it 100 bucks. Mine's for sale, too. I'll take it right off my wall at work. <laughs> no, I get it, and I like enamel pins, and I'd love to have, like, an auto-off-topic enamel pin. That'd be cool, but I wouldn't think it would be a collectible item. I would just think it'd be something I'd want for myself. I looked into making them. They're kind they're, of expensive. They're not, yeah. Are they 15, 20 bucks a piece? Something like that, yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe they're not making a ton of money on them. I don't know. But, hey, more power to whoever Lean from Lean Customs is for finding a niche, growing it, and making it his career. The man sells enough pins now to not have, another, not have another job. So good on him, right? Yeah. I guess they're different enough to not get copyright issues. but Well, because they, they're they're not an actual... They don't say the name of the car on them. And they're not an actual drawing of a car. They're a caricature of a car. It's like a tuned version of a car. So it doesn't require licensing. So he uh, he found the secret way, I guess. <laughs> Hmm. What other events did we go to, Andrew? Have there been any others? No, you t- took me to 4 till 4 when I got here a couple weeks ago. 4 till 4, always good. We went to Highline Autos, yeah, which has good. some good stuff, but it's got a lot of new supercars, which are of zero interest to our listeners. We tried to go to Cars and Coffee the day after JCCS, which it started at 7.30, and we were only like half hour away. We took our time to get there. We were, we're there, there before nine, though. We were there like at nine, like nine, 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 fifteen. Okay, so like an hour and a half, and the thing was already done. 
Yeah, they were like cars driving away as we were getting there. And we're like, uh oh, I think we missed it. Which just seems like a short me. period like, of time. <laughs> cars at coffee at home would go to like 11. Yeah, even here in Arizona, where it gets to be 120 degrees, cars and coffee goes from about an hour and a half in the morning. I was very, very surprised. We did get to see some cool stuff while we were there, at least. Saw a couple cool cars. I was a little bummed because it was a cars and coffee where my car would fit in well because it was for long roofs. That was the theme of the day. Yes, it was long roof week. But oh well, we did see a couple cool wagons over there. I did see a couple of pictures posted afterwards too that uh, we missed some cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, but it is what it is. Unfortunately, you can only do so much stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, I'd say one other thing I'd like to touch on before we go away, um, other than reminding everybody again at this point in the podcast to join the Discord, um, send us a message on Instagram, and we'll hit you up with a link to Discord. If you're in Phoenix, Arizona, at any point in time, there is a car museum here that Andrew and oh, I have right. talked about in the past. Uh, it has moved. Uh, it's called the Martin Museum. It is a collection of cars, all privately owned by one guy whose last name is Martin. First name, I don't remember. We talked about it when Andrew came out here in 2019? I think it was end of 2019. Something like that. Andrew came out here, and we went to the Martin Museum, and it was cool. It was a bit uh, kind of kitschy. It had a lot of like stuffed dolls and stuff sitting in the cars. And oh it was yeah, weird. It, it was. It was. I was. It was, it was tight. interesting. It was tight. It was. I suppose the collection of cars the guy owned was bigger than the building. Uh, anyway, it moved. Uh, it's still called the Martin Museum. It moved into an old like big box store. I don't know if it was, it was like a like a Home Goods or a Right at Home or one of those kind of like Home Goods stores. But he bought the building, hollowed it out. It's twice as big as his old place. And the whole collection is now on display at once. It's a gorgeous space. Like, very well lit. The floors all have this, like, marbleized look concrete. Um, he's got a, a room for the kids with, like, video games and, like, a little ball pit thing, I think, was in there. And, like, little games for, like, the kids to play. Uh, very neat spot. But the thing that sets this museum apart from probably every other museum in the country is the hands-on approach that the owner of the museum wants the visitors to take. You can touch every car. Yeah, it was weird. It felt wrong. I felt like I was going to go to jail. I was waiting for somebody to jump out. Like, don't touch that car! I was waiting for my dad to like drop out of the ceiling and be like, what are you doing touching cars? Like I was five years old. It was very weird. I don't understand. It was a little bit to sit in a car. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit in this 67 Stingray. Yeah. You're like, I've always wanted to sit in a 67 427 four speed Stingray. (laughs) Yeah. So you just did. Yep. And I thought you were going to get arrested. (laughs) You didn't get arrested. It was all good. Yep. And then eventually, one of the guys that works the museum came by on his little rascal scooter. Well, it's a big museum. He's got to get around. Yeah. And. We were like, this is cool. And he's like, yeah, it's totally fine. And we're like, well, how? And he's like, oh, Mr. Martin wants it this way. He wants to, you know, get people involved. And the only way to do it is hands on. So you go sit in the super bird. Like, yeah. Super bird. I, uh, what was that C1 Corvette I sat in? Was it 57? You sat in a 62 Corvette because it had the 63 style taillights. Um, I just sat in it. Really like hard nothing. to get into. Yeah, the steering wheel is the size of a T-bus. Yeah, so it doesn't move or anything. There's nowhere to put your legs. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how people drove those around. <laughs> Not very easily. But, I mean, the first car I sat in, like, I went real low-key. Like, there was an MGB GT, and I was like, all right, I'll try out. I'll, I'll, I'll give this a go. Like, I got in the car, and I was very uncomfortable. Uh, not, I wanted to see what the car felt like inside because I'd never been in a BGT, and I've always wanted one, but I was like, whatever, I'll start with the $8,000 car. Then a 944, but you didn't want to sit in it. I don't need to sit in 944. I own a museum piece here that I can sit in any time I want. It's a very significant car. It has a, a significant prominence. Right, in my yard. Um, yes, yeah, so I sat in the MG and uh, pleasantly surprised how well I fit in the MGB GT. It's very comfortable. I could definitely see driving it a lot. But then it was game on. Like, I see something I want to sit in. I, I you know, <laughs> I broke the seal with that MG. Went ahead and sat in a bunch of stuff. I think the coolest thing I sat in was a Chrysler Airflow. In public square. Like, why is there a Chrysler Airflow I can sit in? That doesn't make any sense. These are rare, rare cars. Just sat yeah. in it. Studebaker. 
uh, what do they call it, a wagon air? With a sliding back roof. Super cool. Then we sat in a dual cowl Phaeton, like 1931 Cadillac. Yeah, I don't know what these things are. I was just sitting in them. Are they expensive? Yeah, that's a very expensive <laughs> car. It was a very expensive car new, and it's a very expensive car now. There were a couple of cars in the museum that did have do not touch signs the on them and ropes cars. around them. They were aluminum body cars. You know, the the uh, continuation Cobra. Yeah. You know, you can't sit in that. It's a true aluminum 427 continuation CSX car. Boat-tail. The Auburn Bowtail. Yeah. The Duesenberg SJ. Yeah. Like, they won't let you sit in those things. But as far as everything else goes, like, it's almost just a free-for-all. Like, Oh, yeah. I sat in a Pantera. You did sit in a Pantera. Yep. That was hard to get into, too. Yeah. You chose a lot hard to get into cars. Like, I'm going to make this a challenge. Well, you're like, how did people drive these things? Yeah. As a daily almost sometimes. But yeah, it's 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 a wild museum. Uh, highly recommend it. It's only $10 a person on top of it to get in. And there's no limit to how long you're there for. Uh, I don't know how long the gift shop will be as cool as it is right now. But even the gift shop is cool because it's all like random die casts that were obviously in somebody's storage unit somewhere for the past 30 years. Yeah, there was a, a, a book area, which was pretty cool. So yeah, it has a whole, like, definitely a whole book area with all kinds of cool books in it. I mean, it was a super cool experience. I I'd, I'd love to go back again. You know, I could kill another afternoon there easily. Yeah. Again, so. the impressive lightning show over here. Yeah, there's a lot of lightning going off in the distance. Yeah, that's the southwest wow. of here. So it's like it's a, almost a constant light on over there. It doesn't look like lightning. It looks like a flickering light bulb. So much of it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's some pretty cool stuff. It's impressive. It's impressive. Anyway, you're going to be here for a little while longer, Andrew, so we probably have a couple more project or updates to talk about uh, as coming, we upcoming. What else was we going to talk about today? Uh, well, September 25th, coming up in Massachusetts, Beverly Police Car Show, oh, yeah. Lynch Park, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., $15 a car. Spectators are free. I would hope so. It's at Lynch Park. Um, and uh, my dad's doing the music. DJ Tony P on the True Ones and Do's. Yep. Excellent. That's actually a fun one. I've been to that show in the past, and I always enjoyed myself. So It's a nice park. It's, yeah, right it's a great ocean. park. Yep. I wish I was there because I drive one of his cars. When is that going to be? 25th. I guess he won't be there yet because he'll be either here or driving back. Yep. Interesting. So on top of that, I think I mentioned it earlier in the show, but the Williams Route 66 JDM Classic in Williams, Arizona is October 1st. That is an excellent take. Look that one up on Instagram at Route 66 JDM Classic. I went last year. It's a show is for a good cause. It is a little bit more expensive to enter a car. It's like $40, but 100% of all the proceeds all go to the charity. Hmm. Uh, and the charity helps uh, kids that have uh, special needs. So actually, I think the name of the charity is Helping Special Children. It's a very good charity. They're heavily involved with the show itself, so definitely well worth your 40 bucks. Yeah. That's coming up, and uh, I know I will be in California in November on, I think, the 19th. I'll have to double-check the dates, but double-check for yourself for Radwood SoCal. Yep. So those are the events, the big events that are coming up. Oh, we've got Japanese Car Day October 16th at Lars Anderson. Excellent. There will be me and a lot of other uh, of our local Massachusetts listeners with Japanese cars. I would there. say a bunch, I won't give a percentage, but a good number of people from the Discord will be there. Yeah, we're talking about it on the Discord, so at least there's at least five or six of us that will probably go. Yep. That'll be that'll be a good, a good time. Mm-hmm. I, I do miss that show. It's no JCCS, obviously, and no Route 66 Classic, but... It is a heck of a show, and it's the really only show of its kind on the East Coast. Yeah, it's a it's a very good time. So, excellent show. But uh, I think on that note, Andrew, is there anything else you want to talk about tonight? Nope. Excellent. As always, keep cars analog, and aim for the roses. Yeah.